This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. Thank you. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and get ready because this one is going to get weird. I mean super weird. I mean making Yellow Submarine and It Couldn't Happen Here look like models of cinema verite. Our next defender, Listomania. This movie comes from the mind of Ken Russell, and if you're at all familiar with his style, it should give you an idea of what we're in for. Russell has frequently dabbled in musical subjects, including biopics on Tchaikovsky and Mahler, the film adaptation of The Who's Tommy, and, and this is true, the promo single video for Phantom of the Opera. Seriously, look that one up on YouTube. It's peak 80s mega musical fromage. This particular film features Roger Daltrey in the title role, tying into the conceit that Franz Liszt was a forebearer of the modern rock star, which is pretty close to the truth, actually. The term Listomania was coined by Liszt's contemporary, Heinrich Hein, to describe the composer-pianist's extraordinary popularity in the 1840s, especially among young women. Fans would pack his concerts, carry his picture in lockets, and fight over memorabilia from scarves to gloves to cigarette butts. Scientists at the time, being gross 19th century men, considered the phenomenon some manifestation of female hysteria, but it probably had to do more with seeking an outlet from societal repression, combined with the fact that List was, as the mortals these days say, a real snack. All of this has surprisingly little to do with the actual subject at hand, which, well, it's better if I just show you as much as I can. So let's examine the case of Listomania. We open on Franz Liszt and his current lover, the Countess Marie d'Agoul, making undercranked whoopee in time with a metronome, at least until Marie's husband bursts in in pre-French Revolution chic and challenges the naked Franz to a duel. The count is looking pretty sore, but if France lives to write some more, I think it will be called Great Balls of Fire. So, our first song about 19th century rock god Franz Liszt is a country folk ballad, which just describes what's happening on screen in a way that doesn't add to the humor, while Marie eats a banana in what I fear will be the most subtle phallic imagery we'll see. Even for the amount of nonsense we're in for, the opening sequence is particularly absurd, and although it gives the pretty decent metaphor of the Count imprisoning Franz and Marie in a piano and leaving them to be hit by a train, a clear indicator on the composer's issues with commitment, the ideas evoked by the image will kind of be forgotten after a while. This will be a recurring theme. Apparently what we've witnessed is some kind of flashback, and we join Franz at the height of his popularity, hounded by paparazzi and fans, constantly attended by mostly undressed women, and hanging out with pretty much every other mid to late 19th century composer you've ever heard of. It's basically the party scene in weird, but for classical music. Among the names dropped is Richard Wagner, here portrayed as a young up-and-comer dressed like the Cracker Jack mascot, who shows Franz some music from his first opera, Rienzi. Franz is mildly impressed and offers to do an improvisation on Wagner's themes in his concert that night, but Wagner has some misgivings. <laughs> With all that other stinking crap, like chopsticks? That would be impressive, as this is apparently 1842, and the piece that would become known as Chopsticks is a good 35 years in the future. But then in 1842, Brahms would have been 9 years old, Mendelssohn would have been 33 and also never lived long enough to be an old man, Rossini was in his 50s and taking a break from composing, and I don't even know why I'm getting into historic accuracy, because this is obviously not that kind of movie, so moving on. Wagner is indeed offended by Liszt joking at his expense and showboating to the audience, which is comprised mainly of teenage girls. But Franz is having a grand time, apart from the occasional baby mama bursting on stage demanding he acknowledge his offspring, and he sends his roadie Hans von Bülow out to scope out future conquests. Mercifully, he focuses on the few legal adults in the crowd, among them the Russian princess Carolyn, who he finds particularly intriguing. She said it's ever you're in Petersburg to look her up. Oh, well, make it the millionaires. The actress was prettier. What the hell we going on tomorrow? We'll have them both. This is not going to be easy to address without sounding like a moralizing prude, but still, 
We have got to talk about the overabundance of naughty bits in this movie. Nudity in art can have many purposes. It can be anything from beautiful and arousing to provocative and shocking. Liz Domania leans more towards the latter side of the spectrum, but Russell's excesses severely dilute the intended shock value. With constant scenes of women going around tits out, or literally every single column in the set being a barely disguised Johnson, the persistent in-your-face sexuality can't help but have diminishing returns. We hope it shocks you, cause we're really putting a lot of effort into it. That about sums it up. Also, I have to add sin number three in here, as all this nudity makes this case really hard to edit. Back at home, Marie, now Franz's long-suffering mistress, is being ignored as long-suffering significant others are wont to do. She's annoyed because Franz won't keep it in his pants for her either, and Franz is annoyed by her aristocratic airs and the scandal of the whole relationship affecting ticket sales. We get the usual amount of, I'm doing this for my family! You never see your children! Because even in a weird-ass Ken Russell biopic, some cliches are inevitable. Hello, Mommy. Hello, Daddy. Speak of the angel, here comes one of the kids now. This is Cosima, eldest of Franz and Marie's three children, who peruses her parents' salacious letters to each other while admitting she goes on the roof to eavesdrop on their lovemaking through the chimney. Her creepiness will only get worse from here on out. While Marie goes to give the kids a stern talking to, Franz stays behind and reminisces of happier times. Said happier times take the form of sin number four, Love's Dream. Here we have an exaggerated parody of domestic bliss juxtaposed over a genuinely sentimental song, somewhat akin to Little Shop of Horrors, Somewhere That's Green. But here the humor isn't strong enough, and the sentimentality is entirely at odds with the movie in general. And the implication that his relationship with Marie is somehow responsible for Franz's current creative stagnation is only slightly insulting because, like so many ideas in this movie, it's forgotten almost as soon as it's brought up. Before long, Franz is off on another tour, this time to Russia to play for the Tsar and bury himself face deep in Russian women. Marie swears this is the last straw, but Cosima is more philosophical about the situation and helps her father pack. While doing so, Franz declares that he'd sell his soul to get his creative flow back, which nobody ever says in the movies without being expected to follow through on it one way or the other. Why, will you miss me? Not while I've got a little daddy to play with. This movie is starting to get creepy in ways I hope even Russell didn't intend. Indeed, the doll is of the voodoo variety not to mention the Chekhov's variety, sending Cosima's creepiness from Village of the Damned to Bad Seed. Don't worry, Daddy, you shall write nice tunes again. I pray to God every night that you meet the devil so you can sell him your soul, just like you wanted. That's not how that works, but never mind. In Russia, Franz pays a call on the Princess Carolyn, but before she will receive him, he has to be locked in a room and gassed with wall butts while he strips to the waist. So you managed to get your shirt off. In Carolyn's extremely suggestive throne room, they have a conversation about pretense or some such while Franz wears a dress and Carolyn steps into a confessional to quick change into a leather bustier. Don't look at me, I'm just describing what's on the screen here. We also get a bit of backstory. Franz had thoughts of taking holy orders when he was younger. I know, but stay with me. But his dad put the kibosh on that idea, probably because he was making good scratch trotting his kid all around Europe, and Franz felt compelled to continue the practice to support his mom and siblings after his dad died. Everybody got that? I mean, it doesn't really come into play all that much, but it's still nice to know. Carolyn promises that if Franz commits himself to her, he will write great music once again, at which point the movie gets even weirder if that's possible. I'm 
not even sure we can call this symbolism anymore, even heavy-handed symbolism. You don't get more aggressively blatant than male character gets ten-foot-tall baloney pony, and all the women in his life do a production number celebrating his maypole to the point of using it like an actual maypole, before his current lover, who is dressed like a demon, has his wedding tackle dragged to the guillotine because he can be a great composer or a major fuckboy, but not both. I'm sure there's something interesting one could say about the intersection between artistic inspiration, sexual catharsis, and spiritual ecstasy, but this movie is too concerned with shoving an enormous tallywhacker in our face to actually say it. We cut away from that, pun not intended, to find Franz as Carolyn's prolific yet despondent kept man. Carolyn's current husband refuses to grant her a divorce so their boinking can be officially sanctioned, Marie has written a tell-all book about their relationship, and Franz is unable to help his countrymen who are fighting in the May Revolution. So he sits in his very literal ivory tower, singing about his guilt and helplessness while a convenient bomb takes Marie and the extraneous children out of the picture for good. Hey. At this point, who should re-enter the picture but Wagner, on the run from the local authorities. Franz covers for his old friend, they've had all of one scene together but they're old friends, trust me, but generally isn't too thrilled by Wagner's political activities. He would be less thrilled if he knew Wagner's real purpose, which is to drug Franz and drain his blood, thereby stealing his music which he plans to use to become the leading sound in German nationalism. get into that a little bit later on, but for now we must discuss sin number six, which is that this movie really doesn't have anything to say. The officially stated premise, an examination of the Listomania fad through the lens of mid to late 20th century popular music, barely lasts through the first act. Most of the second feels like it's trying to be about the tension between Liszt's religious beliefs and his sexual appetites though mostly this is conveyed by a lot of religious statues and oversized pork swords, and then the third goes completely off the rails as Franz becomes the Vatican's champion against Wagner's anti-Semitic fascism. Because the Vatican has such a great track record on standing up to anti-Semitic German fascists. At no point does this movie have any particular ideas about any of these themes. It just skims the top of them while using a lot of bizarre set dressing to do it. And its surrealism is not an excuse. Other surrealist directors like Jean Cocteau and Terry Gilliam have told compelling stories in dreamlike settings in a way this movie doesn't even approach. While Wagner runs into Cosima and Hans, Cosima and Hans are married now by the way, and does a bit of creepy flirting with the former, Carolyn comes in to announce her husband has finally granted her a divorce, and now the only thing standing in the way of her marrying Franz is the Pope's blessing. So it's off to Rome to request that in the most extremely Catholic ceremony ever. <laughs> is a little ambivalent about the marriage, and no wonder he's having to pull organ duty at his own wedding, and confesses his misgivings to a mysterious monk with a distinct Liverpudlian accent and an even more distinct nose. The end result is that the Pope refuses to sanction the marriage, and Franz decides to join the Franciscans. This doesn't last long even by the standards of this movie because the whole chastity thing really isn't Franz's vibe, which earns the ire of the mysterious monk in his true form of Pope Ringo Starr. I heard one of your new compositions yesterday. The Cantata, glorifying Christ's representative on earth. You mean the one I wrote about you, your holiness? Magnificent. Pope Ringo lectures Franz on throwing away a promising career in the sacred music industry and informs him that Cosima has abandoned Hans to marry Wagner, who has been writing evil music and amassing power and generally becoming the boss's representative on earth. The only way for Franz to atone for his own sins is to exorcise Wagner and restore him to the Catholic faith. So Franz is off to Germany, but he has little success at first as he tries to get information from the local Jewish community, who react to Wagner's name like Tokyo residents in a kaiju movie. Direct me to Wagner's castle. <laughs> Eventually, Franz locates Wagner's castle. Again, real subtle Ken where he is greeted by Hans, now Wagner's resident Renfield. 
Hans refuses to give Liszt admittance on the grounds of it's too dangerous, you must leave at once. So Franz goes around the back and peeks in the window, where he finds the lack of subtlety has become even more lacking as he witnesses what is basically a combination of a Black Sabbath and a Hitler Youth rally. The young devotees are treated to a bit of propaganda performance art as a troop of naked blonde women dance around a giant stone schlong before being attacked by a brutish figure with a Star of David imprinted on his forehead. It's a horrific display of racist paranoia, and the movie makes sure we know how horrific it finds it by showing us every rapey, boob-bearing detail. Afterwards, Wagner, sporting blue and red spandex because he's a Superman, get it, appears and sings a creepy nationalist anthem with Cosima on backup. The hour of That's no tomorrow belongs to me, I'll tell you that much. As Cosima goose steps the kids off stage, Wagner changes from his stage clothes into a kind of 1970s Victorian pimp getup, and Franz enacts his brilliant plan of just knocking and hoping Wagner lets him in. Luckily, Wagner is in a good mood and also needs someone to listen to his villain rant. Don't tell me you're going in for electronic music. German music is good enough for me, or will be, when we rid it of the Jews. <laughs> Wagner has created a kind of Frankenstein's Thor to carry out his evil deeds, which he plans to bring to life with his music. Which, honestly, is a good metaphor for the composer's ties to 20th century German nationalism. Or it would be if the vivification process involved, say, Ride of the Valkyries, instead of some atonal nonsense interspersed with angry German and fart noises. Because Russell can't resist overcomplicating things. And if this entire scene served any purpose other than Germans love their beer and piss jokes. And also a Rick Wakeman cameo. Rekindle the flames of German unity! <laughs> Seriously, can we get Mel Brooks in here? Now there's a man who knows how to make fun of Nazis. Franz points out that Frankenthor was doomed to be a bust because a true leader must have a soul. Wagner invites Liszt to help him out on that point and is firmly declined. Wine, women, and song. We share many interests, Franz. Like my daughter, my money, and my music. There's and now the time has come to discuss the way the movie oversimplifies the relationship between Franz Liszt and Richard Wagner. Now, I'm not going to argue about portraying Wagner as an anti Semitic nutjob because, honestly, that part's true. But the notion that he was a bumbler who only got where he was by riding Liszt's coattails isn't. Rather, both composers influenced each other over the course of their long association. I think it would be more interesting to portray Liszt and Wagner with something like a Jesus Judas or Hamilton Burr dynamic, two friends whose relationship breaks down under increasingly incompatible ideological differences. But then we wouldn't have time for the crass humor and oversized dinguses. Franz's attempt to dose Wagner's cocktail with holy water fails, apparently because Franz has lost his faith in the church. But he still believes in music and summons up a little Die Sire to do battle. You remember those old playground carousels that kids would get going really fast until the centrifugal force flung anyone riding it into the jungle gym? Don't know why I thought of that just now. Wagner is ultimately crushed under his own giant stone custard launcher, and Cosima comes in to rail at her father while Hans knocks him out from behind. Franz is imprisoned in a mirrored swastika room where Cosima tortures him by voodoo doll before resurrecting her late husband. The lack of subtlety isn't even 2 by 4 level anymore. It's more like a sequoia trunk at this point. Having achieved his final form as Franken-Hitler and armed with a guitar machine gun, Wagner advances on the local Jewish enclave. Look, 
Obviously, Russell is firmly against the Nazis here, but treating their targets as flailing cannon fodder stereotypes kind of diminishes the message. Franz watches the grotesque, in multiple senses, massacre, and sees Hans Field mowed down and Cosima leading the kids on their own little crystal knocked. But when Cosima sees Franz through the window, she decides to finish him off once and for all. ascends to the other side where all the women he's loved, including Cosima, strangely, join him in a celestial chamber orchestra. It has something to do with their past sins being buried with their mortal bodies while the good in them is immortalized through Liszt's music, or something. Also, the stage is supported by giant trouser monkeys because of course it is. What are we going to do about Richard? I at least had someone to pray for my soul, but he hasn't even got one to say, poor soul. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> yes, what are we going to do about that naughty genocidal scamp? The answer, it turns out, is to join together in a Voltron pipe organ spaceship, which they use to descend via Monty Python animation to Earth, where Frank and Hitler is having a grand time amid the ruins of Berlin. Well, good thing the Jewish people had a blonde messiah and his team of pure white angels to take out their persecutor for them, right? I mean, never mind that Liszt, being a devout 19th century Roman Catholic, didn't have the most charitable views of Judaism himself, and Cosima was just as bad, if not worse, than her husband, and would continue to promote Wagner's nationalist and anti-Semitic philosophies right up to the dawn of the Third Reich. It's the thought that counts. Play us off, keyboard Roger Daltrey. Now love, our love, our love has ended war. Listomania is the ultimate example of gilding the lily. Franz Liszt's life, his rock star like appeal, the odd contrast between his carnal relationships and his spiritual fervor, his profound influence on his contemporaries and successors, already has the makings of an interesting movie, one which could easily be done in a stylized, anachronistic style like Boz Lerman's Elvis. But Russell buries any hope of that under a disjointed, barely coherent narrative and a stifling overabundance of boobies and skin flutes. Therefore, the Court of Musical Hell condemns him to experience this sensation of frantic futility by running an unending version of the Wonderland Caucus Race. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs>